eating the cake and the snow falling. And sometimes the story just ends here, in the snow, with the Indians eating the cake. But the real climax is a few miles down the road. And I'm telling you... Pelletier? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, I would uh, like to make the following adjustments under the superintendent's report. A, I would like to add uh, the director of curriculum to make a very short report on staff development this summer. And under B, if I may add that, I'd like to uh, make a report to the school board that will which I'll pass out to them on the results of the Administrative Council two-day workshop. That's the total of your adjustments? That's the total of my adjustments. I have uh, several adjustments uh, under Board Chairman's uh, report. The School Board's Legal Council will be here this evening to uh, report to us on uh, the freedom of access law and so that will constitute um, paragraph C or item C and also our auditors will be here to report on the audit they are in a neighboring municipality tonight and they hope to be able to be here by 830 or so that is uh, remains to be seen but uh, when they do come we may have to adjust the uh, the order uh, to accommodate them under new business uh, we'll have a new item nine which will be uh, Jan Solon's uh, discussion of uh, certain changes in the gifted and talented program and a new number eight nine ten eleven which will be uh, Jan Solon reporting on the search uh, committee. Do any board members have adjustments to the uh, agenda? Seeing none, uh, I would ask if the public have any items that they would like uh, placed on the agenda. Yes, uh, I'd like to discuss the continued professional relationship of the present superintendent to the town of Cape Elizabeth subsequent to October 1st, 1990. Yes, could you uh, just tell us your name, please, for the minutes? Patrick Haynes. Thank you. Let me look for a minute to see where that would be. Um. Do you mind uh, where that appears? Are you in a hurry to to leave here tonight? <laughs> Okay, I'll, uh, um, I will put that down and uh, perhaps we'll take it um, under new business. However, uh, if we put it in the beginning, we'd have to limit the discussion in order not to take time away from the previously scheduled items. If we schedule it toward the end, that allows us to give it rather more time. <coughs> I don't think any of us are going anywhere, so. Yeah. None of us are going anywhere, so if, if we can, if it's all right to do it before nine, if that's fine. Okay, we'll, we'll try to accommodate you uh, before nine o'clock then. The next item on the agenda is approval of the minutes of the August meetings and the three September special meetings. Uh, Charlie, I've got one comment this time, but I'll bet you've got it too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only going to pick it up if you miss it. I must have missed it. Oh, oh. Uh, yes. oh I can't believe that. <laughs> On page five of the superintendent's report for September 5th, 1990. <coughs> we 
y'all there? I'm not there, yeah. At the bottom of the page, Jan Solon second the motion and the board approved with a vote of, and there's no. That, that's the. Uh, there's no. It's a computer, yes. I thought I it probably was a copying oh, machine, yeah. but uh, that was the one that uh, I noticed. Are there any others? Have I have five to zero on mine. Okay, well, I just don't have it. So it was the copying machine. It was the copying right, machine. Fine. You're vindicated, Charlie. Your record is perfect, intact. Uh, okay, if there's no further uh, amendments, I would uh, entertain a motion that these minutes be approved as with that one correction. So moved. Second. Second. Any further discussion? Mr. Chairman, there was someone who raised their hands on the floor. Uh, to discuss the minutes? No, I wanted to. I don't know. She had an adjustment, I think. To Fine. The let, let, let us just finish this motion, and then uh, you could come forward. And uh, uh, so uh, it's been uh, moved and seconded, and there's no further discussion. So all in favor of approving the minutes as submitted as corrected. It's a vote. All right, uh, Mrs. Joyce. <coughs> My name's Diane Joyce, Chairman Leslie, members of the school board. Before you, please sign a copy of the certification and letter from the town clerk certifying the proper number of signatures of registered voters have been received by the town hall on August 13th. Signatures were collected and 20% of those voting in the last gubernatorial election were needed. The 909 certified signatures are more than the 866 needed to send the citizens' request for a referendum to the voters so that all citizen voters in Cape can elect to increase the size of the school board to seven or if defeated to allow the membership to remain at five. One term will be for three years and the other will be for one year allowing consistency in the school board. Although there is no town council vote on this matter, there will be a public meeting at Wednesday, October 10th, 1990. The town of Gorms and Yarmouth have recently increased their membership on the school board from five to seven and the voters approving the change by a three to one margin. The town of Scarborough and Freeport are seriously considering the change as well. We have heard and read statements by members of the board suggesting that there would not be enough interest in running or candidates to fill all four positions in the May election. This was a primary due to the fact that Loretta and Jean ran unopposed in May election. We would like the public and the board to know that there will not be a problem this year. There have already been five members of the public who have committed to running in the May election if the random is passed in November. I would like to also at this time, I don't want to take all your time, but like to thank Judith Millett, um, Kathleen Brenner, um, Holly Reedy, and uh, Lynn Levitt for my committee and helping us push this through, and uh, Debbie Piazzo and the attorney and uh, the town that helped me get it all together, all of us. Thank you. Thank you. The next item of business is the business manager's report. This is uh, not one of the scheduled uh, quarterly reports. So Dee, do you have... Uh, Sorry, John. No, no, I proved them in, in, in total. Oh, did we? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. My apologies. I, I uh, <coughs> did the motion, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, my apologies. Okay. So, D, thank you, Peter. Uh, tonight, I present to you a report on the uh, project expenditures for the uh, bond issue as of uh, 88, 89.90 school bond. And I broke it down by expenditures as of 630.90 and then expended from July 1st through September 7th, last Friday. Uh, of the $600,000 that was approved last year, to date, as of June 30, we had expended $481,000. Uh, we expended $69,703 in the two and a half months this summer, mainly because of the, the water damage claim we have at the middle school. Uh, I spoke to the insurance companies on numerous occasions. MMA is now dealing with the other insurance and and uh, verifying the uh, the uh, the uh, the coverages and you know what the implications will be, they will at some point make a full report to us as to what what they uh, they feel the uh, the contractor's insurance will be contributing towards the damage. 
basically, there's $48,000 left in the uh, $600,000. Mr. Chairman. May I Charlie? ask a question on, since he's on that particular bond? Sure. Are all of these projects uh, paid in full at this point, other uh, than the, the, the insurance claim? Uh, there's still some to be paid on the tennis scores, Charlie. Uh, we have a balance of roughly $18,000 to pay out in the tennis courts. Uh, we would like to make that payment we can, however, because the, uh, the contractor that was doing the, uh, the tennis courts has filed for Chapter 11. Therefore, the creditors, we had been paying some of the subcontractors through the town on a, a two-party check, making it to the contractor and to the subcontractor. We've been advised by the town attorneys that we can't do that now because of the Chapter 11 filings and those are now assets of the company, therefore they, we have to wait for either the bonding company or the, the course to tell us what to do about the $18,000 that we have left to pay. Uh, the, uh, the high school emergency lights, that $11,000 will be carried forward, I believe, in, in all its entirety because we did secure two grants to fund those. So we don't anticipate using that money at all. The rest of the projects, uh, are basically done, except we will be expending some more money on that asbestos removal due to that insurance claim. What's the nature of the legal services? That That's the $2,100 that when we did secure the $600,000 bond, that's the attorney's fees right. that the town and the school kind of split. That's our share of the uh, legal fees. So that has nothing to do with the tennis courts no. or, or the, no. the, the uh, no. insurance claim? No. That was paid to bond council when the uh, bonds were, were uh, drawn up. Dee, did you have time to uh, research the latitude that we have to spend the money in other ways if, for example, uh, we have a shortfall in, uh, in one account? Uh, Good we, question, we, we budgeted uh, 100,000, but it comes in at 90. Uh, I would imagine that money would stay in the account and then carried forward. Uh, I think uh, I talked to Michael at one point. Next summer, we, we are faced with the replacement of two oil tanks at an estimated cost of 125000 Our plans are not to go out and secure another bond, but to possibly come up with <coughs> most or a lot of those funds out of these two bond issues. Well, let's uh, but look at the bond point. agreement and yeah. uh, you know have council advise think, us if that's sure. necessary because um, if we do get the approval from the town council for the bond, mm -hmm. and if we go to the uh, the bondholders, tell them that we're going to use the money for a certain purpose, and then it doesn't go that way. I understand. I'd like to make sure yeah. that uh -huh. that we have that latitude. No problem. I'll get back to that. Okay. Uh, the next page addresses the uh, the present 9091 capital projects. Uh, we had been approved for $422,500. To date, we have expended $258,000, with uh, $164,000 left to be expended. Looking over the, uh, some footnotes, I noticed that uh, the, the roofs, the total roofs expenditure will be approximately $301,000 out of the 391 budget. So there's approximately $90,000 that would be carried forward in that account. Uh, the exterior doors, we just got the bill uh, this past week. That's why it hasn't been paid. It's 10,906.70 $10, out of an estimated uh, 10,572. So we'll be over by 300 some dollars. The phone system at the high school, uh, the basic system was 16,100 some odd dollars. We had to add some uh, more circuits and, and lines and things of the sort. And I believe. It is now like at 19.3 or 19.4 for the total bill. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to ask a question about the asbestos problem. Um, who was it that, that told us that asbestos can be contained by being covered with carpet? Are, are we absolutely sure that that is accurate? That was done by the uh, Balsam consultants, the engineers that, that 
uh, when the state did this survey two years ago, they hired this, this firm out of New Hampshire that did all the, the basic school systems in the state of Maine. They, in turn, we kept them and hired them as consultants to write an O&M plan for us, observe and maintain, because they had all the data, all the charts where the asbestos was, was, uh, was identified, the, you know, if it's a, a class one, class two, three, or four type of asbestos. Uh, at that point, they, uh, they were on site. We called them in on site when that incident did happen, and they determined that the, the mastic below the, the, the tile was positive, and the only other way to do that would have been to sandblast and, or do other things which would have been quite timely and costly, and the best measure that they could recommend at that time was for us to, to lay carpet over it. The O&M plan does identify that beneath the carpet there is mastic that is positive but perfectly all right. Their recommendation to us was to do that. And on the roof that um, was just fixed, uh, who inspected that before the kids went back to school today? The, uh, the engineer that the school had on, on a retainer last week. Uh, Mr. We met, yeah, we met Sunday night. Thank you. And we did get a, a, uh, a letter of occupancy this morning from the uh, building inspector. Oh, okay. D is the, the are the third floor renovations somewhere in this capital projects or did that? No, third floor renovations. Uh, I did some further checking on that. We have paid some money out. That did come out of the middle school uh, contracted services account, the 34th, uh, 20, 2430 account, 87, 8850, 2430. Do you know how much that was? Total? We have paid to date six thousand. Okay, what was that on the initial contract for the renovations? But now we have some corrections to the renovations, so that's I did, I did that will add to the cost. The, the, the original estimate of that of that project was in the was in the vicinity of ninety one hundred dollars, I believe. The major cost of that was to reroute the the intercom system, the the, uh, the sprinkler system, the, uh, the fire alarms. Uh, back to when we came up with the four, fifth, four and fifth uh, grades at that uh, section of the, uh, of the building. And, and this year with, I believe, it's a couple of fourth or fifth graders across from the middle school principal's office or in that vicinity, we, we had to reroute some of that intercom system down that hallway, past the gymnasium, and that's part of this cost also. Uh, the intercom, the, uh, the uh, sprinkler systems, the, uh, the fire pull things, uh, all of these are part of that cost. Okay. Um, on the new official opening day of school, which was Thursday, I walked through with the um, assistant principal of the Pond Cove Intermediate Unit, and I observed on that third floor the two classrooms of Mrs. Casey and Mr. Lynn that now have about a five foot opening. I've talked to you about this, but what are the plans to self-contain those classrooms? Friday afternoon, I got in touch with the uh, Steve Dodge from the fire marshal's office in Augusta. He has given us through the building inspector the okay to reinstate or, re or put back those doors in place with the stipulation that the architect has now drawn up the plan that, uh, the floor plan that shows where the doors will be uh, reinstated. At that point, then we will get the permit from, from uh, Mr. McVeigh's office and have the doors put back. Do you have it's, any idea what time frame that will be? Hopefully, I talked to the architect yesterday and today, tomorrow the plan should be in my office. Uh, hopefully this weekend. If the, the it's gonna be at least a 36 inch door. It's a five foot six opening, I believe. I, we probably end up putting two doors on one big one. But it's gonna be at least 36 inches. Hopefully, if the hardware and the doors are on hand, it will occur this, this weekend, Saturday. Because as an observer, I found it very distracting it is. between two it classrooms, is. and I can imagine the it teachers is. and students also. Thank you. Any other questions? I guess the next two pages is basically the, the grants as far as uh, what we've been awarded for energy grants. Uh, 
during the 89-90 school year, we had applied for grants and did, I guess we didn't receive any or any monies. The money will be coming in this year in the amount of $38,205. And the following page kind of uh, explains as to where that money will be expended. The energy management system is ongoing. Uh, the, the steam traps are ongoing. The lighting changes at the, uh, the Lund School is about one of the projects that I believe might be complete by now. With the engineer checking those out, I would say probably towards the end of this week or next year, in the week for final payment approval. What are specifically the lighting changes? I'd say, I'd have to check, Charlie, but I think what we did there is probably change ballasts or something. Okay. I'd have to get back to you on that. Okay. That has no uh, correlation or <coughs> with the emergency lighting that was done uh, on that? the bonding. The high school emergency lights has, that's not included in this energy thing that was on the bond. Uh, no. The energy money we got for the high school emergency lights are through the state and not through the feds. Okay. Thank you. And through CMP. We got two rebates. Any further questions? The next item on the agenda are comments by the high school representatives. I'd like to first um, introduce Laurie O'Donnell, the other the new school board representative. Um, Pat, the role of the school board representative has been to present an overview of the high school's activities at each monthly meeting. These summaries have been informative. However, they do not allow us to take full advantage of representative responsibilities. Rather than merely relay to you the current state of all sports teams and club activities, we should like to act as a vehicle between you, the school board, and the student body of the high school. Perhaps if we work together, we can eliminate the feelings of isolation so commonly felt by the students. The resulting report could avoid events like the students sit in last May and create a trusting relationship between board and, stu and student. Excuse me. We'd like to come to you each month at these meetings with more than athletic scores. Our goal is to represent the student body by reporting their concerns to you. Not every student can attend these meetings, a reason for creating the school board representative. And since we've been elected, we will voice their concerns and comments as if they were actually here. There are, many, there are many student misconceptions about the administration of the school, but we feel that if we work together with you, we will gain an understanding of the issues that plague our community so that we may explain them to the students. As representatives, we want to work with you. We feel that no one except the students knows better the effects of the, of the decisions you make each month. We want, we want to become involved in a way that will benefit not only our school, but your board as well, in that our input may help you better understand the needs of the students. As we will come prepared to outline the student concerns, we also see the need and are ready to advocate your concerns to the students. We thank you for your overwhelming concern for our safety, for your involvement in student functions, for your willingness to listen, for your careful considerations at budget time, and for your ability to set priorities, the first always being the caliber of our education. Consider us when you have questions, ask us about the effects of your decisions, and use us as the needed bridge between you and the students at the Cables of the High School. <coughs> You had your hand up yeah, first. I have a question. <laughs> no. Are you ready? Sure. How, how do you feel as a high school student that the, the, uh, the visit of the eighth grade for the three days went? Um, I've talked with a lot of students, and I don't think it was a problem. We didn't even see them. Um, it was comfortable, and we didn't interact with them at all. It, it worked well, I think. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> As you know, the eighth graders did return to the middle school today, and like as we said, we didn't find it to be much of an inconvenience, and I personally didn't see any eighth graders at all, and I think the inconvenience was mostly just for our teachers and definitely for the eighth grade students who had been misplaced. And also, we had a very successful freshman orientation on the first, first day of school with the SAC members coming early, and we gave the freshmen tours to hopefully acquaint them with the school so that they'll feel more comfortable. And that's about it. Well, thank you for your uh, report. I think that's a wonderful idea. And uh, do any of the other board members uh, want to uh, comment on that? I th thank I, you. Mr. Chairman, I think it's very positive, and I look forward to their perspective on 
decisions we made and or will make in the future. I, I have a question to ask uh, the middle school principal. There was a suggestion made uh, at the end of our school year last year about possibly having a middle school um, student council representative come to these meetings also and give us perspective. That's right, and actually I was gonna mention that a little bit early, later, but I'll be glad to talk about it now. Um, we are still gonna follow through on that. Our student council elections are gonna start probably next week, and we hope to have some representatives here for you um, in the October meeting. If we're not able to meet that deadline, certainly by November. Before tonight's meeting, I had a chance to speak briefly with Jennifer and Lori, and they agreed to, uh, if we can get all of our schedules together, and we'll certainly find a way to do that, to meet with our middle school representatives to sort of cue them in on how you do reports to the school board, the kinds of things that they might be interested in hearing about. So we look forward to the middle school representatives being here hopefully in October, definitely by November. Thank you. Thank you. I want to make sure that we don't uh, send Jennifer and, and Lori away from here tonight in any doubt as to our receptivity of what she's proposed. I, I personally think it's a great idea and uh, I look forward to it. Uh, do the rest of you? Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Good. That's your mandate. We look forward <laughs> yeah. to your next visit. The uh, Next item is the superintendent's report. Dr. Pelletier. I've uh, asked the three principals and uh, I would also ask Michael to uh, make uh, or plead with them to make a very short report on the opening schools uh, in as much as we have a very lengthy evening. Uh, let's start with the elementary principal, Barbara. And I had all these great anecdotes I wanted to share, but I guess I'll scratch them for now. Um, let me start then with how our enrollment stands. We had a great opening on Thursday. I do have to tell you that despite all efforts to get the word out about no school on Wednesday, we were in faculty meeting at 8.30 um, updating the staff about the status of roofs and all, and one lone kindergarten child and her mother showed up at our door having missed all of the uh, announcements with her lunchbox. And so I went over and greeted her, and her teacher went out and greeted her, and Mom said, hey, another day of summer, let's go home. So I really appreciated all of the parents' patience with us and felt um, most significantly upset for our kindergarten children. But they, they're in now, they're great, they're happy, and, and I can um, assure you that our opening went, went beautifully. For our enrollment, um, we're starting with 137 children in kindergarten, 127 in first grade, 132 in second grade, 137 in third grade, 157 in fourth grade, and 133 in fifth for a total of 822 students. Um, the most notable difference for us in terms of enrollment is in 1988 we began kindergarten with 105, in 1989 with 115, and opened in 1990 with 137 students and demographics are, are sharing that next year's class will be even larger. So that's one of the more significant aspects of our enrollment report. We did uh, enjoy welcoming all of our new staff on board. You met them at the opening day meeting, so I don't need to go over that list again. But for our viewers to know, our most significant change was in fourth grade where a full half of our teaching staff of eight teachers are new to us and their reception has been very warm by both the teachers and the students, and I'm delighted that all of them are with us, including in second grade and some of the specialty areas. Michael's going to be commenting a bit about our summer work, but we did accomplish uh, uh, quite a bit of work in the area of language arts and math curriculum revision. I'll leave it at that and, and let Michael teach you more about that. Another area we made some real good progress, and I'd like to um, announce that I will be sharing this in detail with parents later is a report card revision. That was one of Poncole's goals last year. I didn't believe we could really get to it in an in a intense way until summer, and that in, case, and in fact was the case. But several of us met for, for four days in the summer and did a major revision that we're delighted with. It's been warmly received by teachers, and I'd like to teach parents about it before it's first used in January. Looking ahead, uh, in the month of September and early October, we have had some brief but warm welcome assemblies for all of our children. We had a grade four or five welcome assembly yesterday where new staff was introduced and we had a chance to share with each other. On Thursday, we'll be doing the same with our elementary students. We are delighted to have visiting author Gail Gibbons with us already on September 28th, who will be working with K through five students. 
and of course open house will, which will be following shortly thereafter on October 2nd and 4th. The only other real thing of significance as we get started uh, that I just want to mention to you because it was mentioned very briefly in passing last spring was the awarding of two very important uh, grants that the school received last spring and planning for those have already underway. I will not go into a lot of detail, but I do want to let you know that the one grant on Portland history written by Mary Jo Thompson, that planning has already begun. This is an attempt of a collaborative grant between the Cape Elizabeth, uh, between Pond Cove School and Cape Elizabeth and the Maine Historical Society to publish our wonderful Portland history uh, curriculum that we've developed over the past few years, which will cover the colonial period to the 1900s, and our anchor life of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow has moved now into five full generations. So as students study Portland history, it will be anchored to generations of Longfellows. And it's a really dynamic curriculum, and we're very excited to be working on that. The third grade teachers, especially with the Historical Society, Second of all, we have the African American Studies grant that Nancy St. John and Rachel Clark were awarded, and um, Michael and, one of the and two of the teachers were able to visit with the Graham Parks Alternative School in Cambridge just yesterday to begin working out the details of a relationship we're going to be having with that school program in Boston. Um, it will involve, uh, it will be an integrated program with arts uh, emphasis around the art of black dance and music. There will be performances both in Portland, Maine and in Cambridge involving our, our fourth graders. Um, but also tangents in geography, language, a pen pal relationship, uh, and a lot of other cultural experiences will be coming. And that pretty much will happen later on in the year, but the planning will all take place at the start. So we're really excited about having a, a terrifically enriched year once again. Thank you, Barbara. Mr. Chairman, may I ask a question, Barbara? Um, your system, part of the system, has the increase in students. If I look at the other two, they're down. How many of these are new out-of-district students? Um, I don't have that directly in front of me, Charlie. I can tell you that even at 822, we're slightly below where I projected. I projected we might open at 850. I would, uh, I would say that for a change, we still had a lot coming in, and I'm going to guess as many as 60. Oh, I'm sorry, no, you're saying out of, out of district, district out of period. District, I'm yes. sorry, I misunderstood. I thought you meant new to no, Cape no, Elizabeth. No, no, I mean out of district. Out of district. I don't have that. Connie, do you know offhand? Yes, there are, in terms of staff, children, and, um, and we don't have any. Ugh. I'm going to guess yeah. 15 or less, Charlie. New. But I don't have that number Total right in front. Total or new? Total. New? There are no, no new. new students. That's the policy. Okay. I, that was the question I was going to ask. Is the policy still in effect, and it is, is it on a need review by the superintendent still? Yes. The policy is still in effect, and two young people on the high school level are being considered for uh, between superintendents, and these are cases that... Uh, we would be required to examine very carefully. Okay, the I, only reason I ask that question is that I have received a couple calls this week concerning out of district students that are in the elementary that the parents have not moved here, and I would like that clarified. When we have had a couple out of district enrollments, it's been, um, with the superintendent's knowledge, uh, purchase of home pending contracts, uh, copies of contracts in our hands. That's the only way that happens. But I am also recalling that there's also a new uh, out of district placement from a high school staff member with a kindergarten and second grade child. That's new this year. No, I was going to say, I support Charlie. I already see the same phone calls that there, you know, there seems to be a um, couple of families that say they're going to move in here. Um, don't, have, and I, this is all secondhand at this point in time. Mm -hmm. I don't know how closely we're following that situation. Do we go back and follow up at some point in time to find out if these people have moved into the community? The only case that I'm familiar with, uh, I said to the parent, I want to see a contract. And 30 days later, I'm going to check to see that you're moving in mm -hmm. or what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, that's in the best interest of a child. If someone has a contract that's moving in in two months, it's mm -hmm. a shame to have them go to another school. Mm -hmm. And uh, I only know of one case, and I would appreciate you bringing uh, that to my attention, and I'll check that in the morning. As well as, there's always a possibility we could have a child mm -hmm. here, and we know absolutely nothing about it, and they're here. That happened last year in the case. Mm -hmm. But they should have received a release from their 
the town superintendent. Certainly, that. certainly. However, uh, uh, I think it's possible for a family to enroll a child and use a street number and say their residence and it's their domicile <laughs> and they could fool us. But I reviewed that list last year very carefully. <laughs> and as you know, the majority of the people were our employees. <laughs> but uh, any, if you have any names, I'll be more than happy to check them, and I'm sure the principal yes. will. If, any, if anybody who calls you has specific concern, I'd really appreciate knowing. Mrs. Brown really helps us monitor that and is in communication with the superintendent's office all the time about the two or three pending resolutions of a move. Okay. I just wanted to make sure before I created a situation that I mm -hmm. clarified the policy was still in effect. Yes. Yeah, I, I noticed one other thing that your, your present third grade class decreased. Is it the only decrease in your whole five grades mm -hmm. or six grades? Mm -hmm. uh, is there a reason? I mean, that, it's a nice trend to see, but. Yeah. <laughs> it, for a while, Charlie, three out of my six grades actually showed a slight decrease. That's why I said my projections were um, and more variation than they've ever been in the last several years. And all I can say is we had many more out-of-state transfers come through, some of which came in as late as late August, where we, we've lost children as families have been, you know, moved to other parts of the country. This was not predicted. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Barbara. Nancy? Well, the middle school also had a beautiful opening to school, <laughs> and um, we truly did. And I, I would like to, on behalf of the middle school faculty and staff, thank several groups of people. Uh, we certainly would like to thank the high school teachers, the seven high school teachers who moved out of their classrooms and gave us that space to use for three days. Um, also for their students who were relocated to different spots, and also their fellow high school teachers, many of them who gave up their rooms during planning periods so that the teachers who had moved out of the rooms we used could use their classrooms for their classes. So we really appreciate the cooperation of the high school. Why the eighth grade was there too, many of the high school staff stopped by, and I know the faculty, the eighth grade faculty, felt very welcome there. We'd also like to thank our Pond Cove colleagues as well too. They gave up classrooms and three of their teachers actually put their program on the road. Claire Ruthenberg gave us her art room and delivered art in the classrooms, and we really appreciate that. Rebecca Wing, a brand new teacher to Cape Elizabeth, fell right in line very quickly and took her music program on the road as well too and delivered that while we used her classroom. And Jill Bell, another new staff member, uh, lent us her gifted and talented classroom in the afternoon for an eighth grade French class. So with all of that cooperation, we were really able to get off to a fine start. The other really large thank you from me goes to the middle school faculty who last Wednesday when I presented them with the situation and where we were going to be relocated and left them with the challenge to come up with a schedule where we could deliver as much of our programming as possible, met that challenge, and we opened school on Thursday being able to deliver 99.9% .9 of our programming to our students wherever they were located in the system. And certainly as a new principal, that was a very um, heartwarming thing to come into and made me feel very proud to be a part of the middle school, and I really appreciate um, all of their hard work. We'd also like to thank all the middle school parents. We had almost perfect attendance on the first day of school. We had just one student absent and that student happened to be out of the country. So we felt um, very well supported by the community as well. We open, our enrollment right now stands at 338 students. We have 131 students in grade 6, 101 students in grade 7, and 106 students in grade 8. As Michael will talk in a few moments, we also benefited from some summer work in language arts and foreign language and curriculum. The team leaders also met this summer at the beginning of the summer with Mr. Toy and then at the end of the summer with myself. And we really worked on some of the plans for the middle school this year and really worked out a new discipline policy and cycle for the middle school um, so that we could get things off and running very smoothly. Some special things that are coming up for us. First of all, our student council elections will happen soon. And as I have already mentioned earlier, we hope at our next board meeting to have some middle school representatives to introduce to you who will be bringing you news from the middle school at each board meeting. On Friday, September 14th, our sixth graders will be out. The Chewanke fundraiser begins, and they'll be out selling their gift wrap. It's a very successful fundraiser for them. And they'll be starting that 
this Friday. They'll be getting their materials Friday afternoon in class, so that starts right off for us. The Parents Association is helping us with that. On September 17th, the faculty will be getting together in the afternoon to work on our theme planning as we work for a theme week probably, I believe right now it's tentatively planned for the week just prior to February vacation, and we'll be planning what that's going to be to carry on with a successful um, program that they had last year with the medieval unit. We won't be doing medieval times again, but something like that. We have our open house on September 25th. And we are going to make a slight change in the middle school open house this year in that we are going to stagger the grades a bit to help families who have children in multiple grades. We haven't come up with a perfect solution, though. Um, the sixth grade is going to come in from 6 to 7 p.m. and do their open house and their programming. And then grades 7 and 8 will run a program from 7 to 8.30. We hope this will help with some of the traffic in the hallway, as many of our classrooms are located in a, in a very close area this year and also help some families who have students in both grades 6, 7, and 8. The parents who have students in both grades 7 and 8, it still will be a little piece of magic to get everywhere, but we're working on that to try to help out. On October 16th, we also have um, a meeting with the 8th grade language arts teachers. We'll be meeting with the 8th grade parents as a promised follow-up to our presentation last spring for our program. They'll be giving an update of the program, talking about it in progress as it exists now, and also doing ans answering questions that the parents have about the programming, and they'll be meeting with parents. And then on October 23rd, the Parents Association is going to be sponsoring an evening program where Dr. Efren will be presenting some of the curriculum work and an update directly to the parents um, about what's going on in the middle school, and I'll also be sharing some thoughts and ideas with them about the middle school and having a chance to meet many more middle school parents, I hope. So we really are off to a fine start. School feels very positive. It was nice to have everybody back home today, and it was nice to be all together again in the same complex. Thank you, Bob. Jan? I'd like to publicly thank the teachers as a board member and everybody involved in the system that made all of this work um, for the first few days of school. I know it was an enormous amount of work, and, and it's truly appreciated. Thank you. Frank? You've heard some about the opening of school at the high school already from our um, eloquent student representatives and also from my colleagues. Uh, we opened school earlier than the other two schools this year. We opened it on Wednesday. Uh, and we opened it as Lori described with an orientation for the ninth graders, which we um, find works quite well. It gives them some time in the building uh, without the upperclassmen to find the rooms, find homeroom, check out where their scheduled classes meet so that they don't have to discover this in the uh, hustle and bustle of, of a four minute passing period. Uh, we had uh, everybody in, in a homeroom uh, from 9.30 to 10 and then we ran shortened periods for the remainder of the day and met periods two through eight so that uh, students met all but their first period teacher that first day. Uh, the, the second day, we, we had the eighth grade, which we liked. Um, I think the students uh, have told you that they didn't even know that they were there, and to, and to some degree that's true. That is, the schedules of the two programs were such that we didn't really overlap in the halls or in the cafeteria, and it worked very smoothly. And uh, I, I think we've been uh, very roundly thanked by the, the eighth grade. We enjoyed having them. They were delightful guests. and. Uh, and it worked out very well. And I, I think um, we, we do have a building that does have uh, uh, space, and I think we, we can make accommodations for, for this kind of thing. So we were pleased that it happened. We opened with a total enrollment of 410, which was just exactly the number that we were talking about last spring. Now, how that happened, I don't know, but it, it's, it's worked out. There are 115 in grade 9. There are 95 in grade 10, 96 in grade 11, and 104 in grade 12. Um, we will probably, from the looks of it, and this is, again, what we've been expecting in the demographics, have that same population with, within one or two students, unless there's some large influx amount of town for the next two or three years. And it's only when the current sixth grade gets there that we begin going up each year by about 30 students. We have... Uh, a number of new staff members. We talked about them ex uh, more extensively on the opening day of school, and I will detail them for parents in the parent uh, newsletter that will be going out shortly. 
But one who uh, joined us um, in, in the last week of August is uh, Ted Baker, who is a part-time physics teacher who comes to us with extensive uh, teaching and administrative experience in various universities. He has a PhD in electrical engineering and is um, off, I think, to a fine start teaching two classes of general physics. Uh, we, we have four new students from foreign countries with us this year. We have uh, a young lady from Belgium whose name is Laura Israel. She's staying with Mr. and Mrs. Douglas Stewart in Cape Elizabeth. Their son Matthew is in Belgium on, an, on a rotary exchange um, student fellowship. So Matthew is in Belgium and Laura is here. Um, she, she, as are all the students, are really a, technically members of the senior class, although they take a number of junior courses, that is, they take American history and American literature. From Mexico, we have two young men, Iñaki Ugartechea, whose brother, uh, Luis, was here a uh, year before last, and Inigo Valdez. Um, Iñaki uh, is staying with Mr. and Mrs. William Holt, and Inigo is staying with Mr. and Mrs. John Dockendorf. From Spain, we have a young woman named Garcia Sanchez, and she is staying with Mr. and Mrs. Mark Woodward. Um, her brother, her two brothers, I think, have attended the Cape schools in previous years. Um, uh, the students, um, I think, are all uh, well in, in place. They have uh, schedules. They're taking a number of advanced classes. Uh, they seem to be wonderful additions to our student body, and we are looking forward to, to learning from them this year as well as giving them the opportunity to, uh, to learn with us. Uh, we have a couple of special projects this year. One particularly is uh, working on the the development of outcomes for courses, uh, really outcomes for our whole course of studies, uh, uh, based on, on some grants that we received from the Coalition of Essential Schools. We really have a two-year grant, $10,000 this year and $15,000 next year, to work on outcomes for the school and really for courses and units, and then in the second year to develop uh, ways of demonstrating that students have learned what we set out for them to learn by performance or exhibition or demonstration as opposed to tests. So that one of our major goals this year will be to work on that. Um, we have um, a number of uh, workshop days that we are going to devote to that as well as some of the halftime release days and we expect to have a, a parents forum presentation uh, to the public um, in March on our, the progress that we have made uh, up to that point. We are, having, are developing a steering committee for the grant. Uh, we have invited um, participation uh, from, the, from the parents, we talked with members of Parents Forum, and, and we will be trying to contact some parents to see if we can get uh, a number of, of uh, representatives, maybe one or two. And we've talked with a member of the school board who's expressed interest, although we have not uh, necessarily um, work that out in its final form. But we are anxious to have participation from various parts of the community to help us look at this whole process of, of you know, I use the word carefully, restructuring the high school. It's, it's a word that's been used a lot in the public forums and in, I think Charles Corralt talked about it last week. It's the word that's been used in the state of Maine for several years about uh, uh, changing the way high school works. And really we're talking about changing all of the schools in, in, F, if in effect in, in the United States. I think we're talking about a whole different approach, and I, I think Cape Elizabeth has done a wonderful job putting pieces of that in place in the lower grades, and I think that now we're ready to, to begin to go to work on the high school level on that. We have begun our full complement of fall sports. Um, all the teams are, are um, playing well, and I think uh, having successful seasons, uh, we, we continue to have a large number of students involved in, in sports. Our athletic director, Keith Weatherby, has instituted an additional requirement for student participation in athletics this year. Parents of students playing a school sport must meet with the athletic director prior to that student's participation in sports. Keith held two meetings, one in late August and one, I think, Tuesday, the 4th of September. Uh, the purpose of the meetings is to review and discuss athletic rules and policies. It's necessary for parents to go to one of those meetings a year, that is, prior to the first sports season. So if a student's in multiple sports, they don't have to go to multiple meetings, they just go once. And it's really to iron out an, the understanding about the sports rules with both parents and students. The students go over it with a coach and, and the parents with the athletic director. There have been some physical changes in the high school over the summer that I think are worth noting. The community services office has moved 
and the nurse's office has moved. That is, they've switched offices. Um, the community services office is now in the wing of the building that is towards the middle school. Uh, it is, it is uh, adjacent to the extended daycare uh, classrooms. It has, in a sense, its own entrance now. People do not have to wander into the high school and wonder where, in, in, in fact, community services is. Uh, in turn, the nurse's office is now in the center of the high school where it properly belongs, and both community services and, and our nurse, Mandy Garmy, are very pleased, I think, with their new quarters. Um, Athletic Director Keith Weatherby has a new office. He has moved downstairs into the foyer office uh, opposite the gym next to the, the auditorium, the cafeteria, where he can uh, be more conveniently located to athletic facilities and really student athletes. Um, Finally, as you've heard from Dee, the school has a new phone system, which replaces a system that was really very antiquated, um, and we could no longer purchase new equipment for it. Um, we're gradually discovering how th the system can help us. It's uh, sophisticated enough that we can't all figure out how it works all the time. That is, we can answer it and we can make calls out, but it, it does all sorts of things that m modern phone systems do that we hadn't even believed were possible. Um, but it's really um, an important addition. Um, the school is really quite is really grateful to to Mrs. Jane Greer, the director of telecommunications at Unum, for her help in in putting this package together with us. She, uh, she serves on the community services advisory board, and gave generously of her time and and, and considerable expertise. Um, and uh, we we thank her very much for that. And uh, we we ought to have a phone system that will last us for a considerable time in the future. It's really very good. Yes. When is open house? Open house is October 10th. There's also a parents forum uh, meeting on college admissions um, on Wednesday, October 26th. Um, there will, um, the open house will be at the same time that it has been in the past, really from seven to nine with a, a meeting prior, just prior to the seven o'clock start of, if you will, class rotation. There'll be a meeting, I think, in the auditorium at, at 6.45. Other questions? Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Pelletier, with your permission, I uh, would like to further adjust the, uh, the agenda. I see that our council has arrived, and uh, he has spent quite a lot of time already this week on our business. So if we could, uh, if there's no objection, uh, jump down to uh, the board chairman's report, uh, item B, and then move on through that, uh, the uh, council's report on the freedom of access law um, and then I, uh, if the board agrees, I, uh, I suspect that, uh, is it Mr. Haynes, is that, uh, I suspect that his question may uh, enter into areas of uh, the law, uh, and I would like Mr. Nazza to be here, still be here to address, uh, you know, the issue that you raised. Um, does the board concur with that adjustment? Yeah. Okay, uh, Nick, would you come forward, please? Uh, Nick Nadzo is the uh, counsel of the school board. He's a member of the firm of Jensen, Baird, Gardner, and Henry. Uh, been counsel uh, to the uh, Cape Elizabeth School Board far longer than my involvement, so I, I can't give you a starting date. The, uh, I have in my hand the a memorandum dated November 1988, which was written by Jensen, Baird, Gardner, and Henry uh, on the Freedom of Access Law for the Maine uh, School Management Association. Uh, and it's, uh, to my mind, the, the Bible on the subject. The, uh, and I've been consulting uh, with Mr. Naz on a regular basis uh, in the last few months on this subject. The, uh, the first item on the agenda is uh, Council's report and discussion on the building projects, uh, permits, and design. Mr. Nadzo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, um, I have the, the two items that uh, your chairman has asked me to look at. Uh, one was basically a request to determine whether or not the school department had violated the Freedom of Information Act with regard to some recent issues that had been raised. And, uh, and the other was a request by chairman that uh, we ensure that the school department interests are protected to the fullest extent possible with regard to the recent uh, situation with the roofs at the uh, middle school. I think maybe because of the time, uh, the sequence of time, maybe the freedom of access uh, issue might be best brought up first and then we can deal with the roofs. And uh, 
I think I should say at the outset that uh, I don't intend to raise the blood pressure of anyone any higher than it's already been raised over this last week or so. And uh, I think rather it could be helpful this time to try to have some insight and observations with regard to some issues that have been raised. Uh, I don't think a recitation of charges or counter charges serves any purpose. But I do think that uh, it's an area that is of Im sufficient importance, especially to the public, that uh, it was appropriate uh, for Mr. Leslie to ask me to, to comment on it. Um, it would be easy just to have a quick uh, response that uh, the school department didn't violate the law and, uh, and sit down. But I've been around Cape Elizabeth long enough to know that I wouldn't get away with that. So I think what, in, in the alternative, it's, it's necessary to look in uh, a little bit of detail at what the requirement of the statute is. It is a, it's a complicated statute. It's one which uh, all towns and school boards and other public agencies have to comply with, but yet it's one which is also uh, not as clear as one would hope, and uh, it's probably more difficult for school departments to deal with it than with other public agencies. One of the initial uh, concerns was, uh, comes under the area of the statute dealing with public records. And, uh, the, and it might be helpful to review what, that's, what the statutory provisions are with regard to making public records available. Uh, basically, the statute says that all public records shall be available for inspection or copying by any person. And the cost of that copying should be paid by the person requesting the copies. And the definition of public records is anything that's written or printed uh, from which information can be obtained and which has been received or prepared for the use in connection uh, or in connection with a transaction of public business. But then there are a number of exceptions, and uh, exceptions relating to confidential, any matters that are confidential by statute are not public records. Anything which is privileged by court order or court rules are not public records. In the case of school departments, and, uh, and, and uh, there are two areas that are especially effect affected by these exceptions, and that is uh, records regarding employees and records regarding students. Um, basically, records regarding employees are not public records, and ex with some exceptions, what are called directory information, and that relates to names, dates of employment, duties, and education of employees. That's public. But anything else dealing with, with employees is not. In addition, public records do not include student records. And uh, there's a, a federal statute uh, called the Buckley Amendment. This is after Senator Buckley, who uh, proposed the amendment to a uh, federal statute, which basically says that only parents and students over 18 are entitled to student records. Uh, they are the only ones who have a, a right to see a student's records. Um, Admission file, that includes admission files, scholastic records, test scores, special education records, medical records, and so on. There is an exception to that. Certain state agencies and other officials who have a need to see records can, can see them. Also, certain directory information can be made public. It's name and address, date of birth, and extracurricular activities, and so on. But even those records can only be uh, made public after a, a parent consent has been obtained. And the only other way to obtain student records is by subpoena in court. And then a person must go to court and prove to the court that it's more important that those records be released uh, than it is to protect the privacy of the individuals. I set the, all this out because what it does, and I can assure you that we as lawyers and uh, Main School Management Association and, and other bodies impress upon school department employees and officials and school board members that they must be cognizant of the privileged information uh, and the privacy of both student records and employee records and must be very, very careful that they don't accidentally or inadvertently allow those, that kind of information to become public. And uh, uh, it's, but there are a number of records which are public. Employment contracts are public. Any contracts are public. Any contracts, any document that's approved by the school board. Collective bargaining uh, agreements are public. Uh, documents uh, with information on school business, if that business isn't confidential. Uh, now, 
we have had occasion to review some recent requests that have come in, with re, uh, especially this past spring during the budget process when there was a lot of concern about uh, the, uh, some cuts that were being made and requests for information regarding those cuts, some requests for information regarding the background leading up to the, the recommendation of the cuts. Uh, this included requests for staffing lists, requests for salary and benefit information. Uh, re some of the requests were mixed with uh, efforts to try to persuade the decision makers to uh, reverse the cuts or not consider the cuts and so on. So often the requests for information were, were hard to pull out from what was um, persuasive argument. Um, but after uh, the staff received these requests and the board reviewed some of these requests, um, I know because uh, we were requested to, uh, uh, to provide some guidance on how to respond to those requests. Uh, because of the fact that it was somewhat unclear on some of the requests, the extent to which data had to be provided. Uh, some of the requests uh, <coughs> involved um, issues which could uh, relate to privacy rights of students, special education students, some of the data requested, listed special education students, listed the amounts being provided for special education training and so on. Other uh, information related to names of employees. So there was some concern that any information released not go over that, that line. And uh, we discussed that with uh, staff and uh, uh, frankly I think that as I understand it, as we've reviewed it, information was, was made available with regard to the staff members, the salaries paid to staff members, contracts, collective bargaining agreements, expense reports, and various other items uh, that were requested. I think that in some instances that information not, may not have been provided as quickly as it would have liked to have been provided. The statute has a, a five day working day, uh, five working day time period to provide the information um, and whether in some instances that particular time period may have been exceeded may have happened. Um, I think that uh, based on the information we have in the review of, of the requests and the, and the responses to those requests, it appears that in large measure all those requests were substantially complied with and responded to. Um, the, it's, there's no intent that we could find of a, um, an effort to intentionally withhold information from the public, but rather the, uh, there may have been, if anything, an, a reluctance to give out information that could be protected. There could have been a, a somewhat of a delay as a result of that. Uh, and I think that all I would do at this point is encourage staff, school board, and others to continue to remain abreast of freedom of information requirements. Um, I can say that as counsel, not only this school board, but to others in our office as counsel to a number of school boards and towns throughout the state, I think if there's one subject area that we get more questions on than any other subject area, it's this area. Uh, because People naturally are, are, whenever you get into a statute and you're trying to respond to a request, you want to make certain that you're following the statute. And, uh, and it is often difficult to be sure that you're complying. Um, so that I think that with regard to the records that were provided, it, as far as we can tell, records and information was provided in accordance with the requests that were submitted. Another issue that has come up is a question of uh, executive sessions um, and whether or not the school committee at times uh, discusses matters in executive sessions that are not in fact the subject of those sessions. And again, going back to the statute, the statute does provide that uh, executive sessions can be uh, held on limited subject matters. Uh, those matters involve personnel matters, labor negotiations, consultations with an attorney, uh, suspension or expulsion of a student or discussion of other confidential records. Uh, and when you go into executive session, 
it has to be limited to one of those areas. And because of the fact that the statute is so restrictive on what can be discussed in executive session, it is important that one limit the discussion in that session to whatever subject it was the purpose of it. But we know it is human nature. Sometimes when you're talking about one subject, you start straying off and it relates to something else and you, get, and, and you might get off of it. I think that all we can do is, is attempt, is, to, the, to the extent possible, to pull people back when individual members tend to stray onto another subject, pull them back, and just then when you're, you're out of that session, when you go back into public session, then you can talk about whatever you want. Uh, if, if the subject is, a, is one that requires another executive session, you go back into executive session, but you should limit yourselves to the subject matter that was the subject of the executive session. The last item that we looked at that was brought up that uh, is a possible uh, violation of the Freedom of Information Act was uh, the issue of the reinstatement of the home economics program. Um, as you folks may recall, much better than I am sure, on May 16th, uh, the board did vote as part of its budget deliberations to terminate the home economics program uh, as a, for budgetary reasons, which of course <coughs> resulted in the reduction in force of a teacher and the termination of that teacher's contract. At the board meeting on June 12th, uh, the board considered the possibility of uh, money being raised uh, by the public to reinstate the program. And uh, the board at that time, through a consensus, uh, determined that if in fact the money was raised in some way, that the program would be reinstated. Shortly thereafter, the uh, school board chairman learned that as a result of reduced costs from hiring, that in fact new hires were going to be um, come in at lower compensation levels than anticipated, resulting in a savings that would allow reinstatement of the program. Uh, the board chairman talked to some of the board members individually, determined that in fact the consensus still was there, and announced that the program could now be reinstated. Uh, Mr. Leslie spoke to me about it and wondered if, in fact, this was appropriate to do. Uh, it, the, the recommendation I gave was that any, uh, ac the action was appropriate uh, to reinstate the program. It would require a formal vote of the board, but that certainly announcing that the funds were seen to be available was, was perfectly appropriate. Uh, the <coughs> board, in fact, has on its agenda tonight to reinstate that program and that will be the formal action. Uh, the announcement was in effect an announcement to allow uh, individuals involved to know that the recommendation and the proposed action of the board was to reinstate the program. Um, there's no question that the, the statute requires that all action taken by the board be in public session. Uh, the, their secret votes as such are kind of inconsistency in terms because you can't vote secretly. There's no action that can be taken by a vote. Uh, any action can't be taken unless it's taken publicly. So that um, I think it's uh, fair to say that at, at worst we had here in, in a, a perhaps a, uh, a statement that appeared to say that action was taken, whereas in fact formal final action couldn't be taken until there was a meeting of, of the board in public. Um, and. Uh, perhaps uh, different words could have been used to express what in fact was, uh, was the intent. Um, I, I think that is one that uh, is, is, to the extent that anybody felt that there was some um, uh, inappropriate activity, it's unfortunate, but uh, uh, I, I see on your agenda this evening you will be correcting that and uh, formally voting to reinstate the program and reinstate the teacher involved. So that basically concludes our review of those matters, and uh, we think that uh, I'm sure it won't be the last time issues will come up. I know that the main school management is having its fall conference uh, in about a month. Uh, on that, uh, not, as you, those of you who have attended those conferences might know, every year there's a session on Freedom of Information Act. Every year that's the most popular session, and it's jam-packed because everybody's looking for answers. And a lot of times there aren't perfect answers. So uh, that, I think, though, uh, uh, is one that uh, we've 
you know, every time you go through something like this, you learn something, and the next time, hopefully, can be more responsive uh, and, and allow people to feel that they're getting the, the kind of information they need. Thank you, Mr. Nezzo. Any questions from the board? I have one on executive session. My understanding from your presentation is that it can only be one particular topic that you go into. If it's personnel, it can only be personnel. It cannot be personnel and litigation if it was. Yeah. It's, it, if, if you have, that, that's an interesting question, and I'm not sure I know the exact answer on that. It's not clear. I think uh, often public bodies will say we're going to discuss litigation and a personnel matter and do it all at once rather than litigation and come back out and say now we're going to discuss the personnel matter and go back in. To be absolutely technically super clean, probably you should have come back out of public session and then go back in. I, I know that many uh, public agencies choose just to go into executive session uh, on, if there's, there's more than one item, list the, 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 the two items, for example, and then just carry from one to the other. But if you do that, you don't want to then stray on to a third one. Uh, again, you're, you're limited to what you have voted to talk about. Thank you. So our motion should be to uh, go into executive session to discuss a personnel matter. That's correct. We finish with that matter. We come into public session. I entertain a motion to go into executive session again for a different personnel matter, come back into public session and entertain a motion to go into executive session to discuss litigation. That's right. That would be your squeaky clean way to do it. <laughs> All right, that's what we'll do. Now. <laughs> Bringing the cots. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, that's called crossing your T's and dotting your I's. Yes, I think Quote that's it, twice. <laughs> yes. Uh, said that, I'm sure that uh, I, I'm, uh, as many boards do that as don't do it. So. Uh, uh, any uh, further board questions on um, uh, freedom of access and executive sessions? If not, then uh, Nick, would you like to go on to the other item on the agenda? The, uh, the other item was a request uh, by Mr. Leslie for us uh, as soon as the, the issue of uh, potential problems with the middle school roofs uh, surfaced, uh, requested us to uh, jump in and just make sure that the school's interests were protected, uh, realizing that uh, these things can get um, litigious uh, at worst and, and at least uh, confusing at best. Um, as you know, work is still going on by the contractor with regard to uh, removal of the, and storage of, of the roof uh, in what's known as Section D. Uh, and work is still going on by the consulting engineer uh, with regard to ensuring that, in fact, uh, um, uh, whatever is, is going to be done now and in the future is, is appropriate. So that this is, at best, uh, somewhat of an interim um, report, if you will. and. Uh, and to the extent that uh, it might involve some matters that would touch on uh, some legal issues uh, that aren't appropriate for public discussion, uh, I, I have avoided those and uh, would hope that uh, wouldn't be asked to comment on them. Um, as you know, there were th three areas uh, involved. One was the industrial arts roof uh, at the middle school, which was uh, installed in 1989. And uh, that was uh, uh, installed in accordance with design plans prepared by an architect. And a uh, contract for the work was uh, um, put together with a contractor, which uh, requires a contractor. It's a form, uh, American Institute of Architects form, which uh, requires necessary permits uh, be applied for by the contractor. Uh, in this case, in fact, no permits uh, were applied for. and. Um, and the construction has been completed. Um, the, your independent engineer has been involved in reviewing uh, that construction, has determined that there is no hazard to uh, any safety uh, to the students uh, at this time, but is going to be continuing to look as to whether or not any other uh, changes should be made to the structure. Our recommendation on this is to that uh, after you re obtain the report uh, from the engineer, and uh, if, in fact, there is any, any action suggested that that be uh, uh, completed and then obtain a after, what is in effect, an after-the-fact building permit uh, from the uh, 
uh, code enforcement officer of the, for the town. And in addition, then, they would be able to issue a certificate, certificate of occupancy. That would put everything up to snuff. Um, again, as what I would rather not do at this point is discuss uh, who is responsible ultimately for uh, costs, uh, who's, who's liable, and, and so on. There's a lot of issues here which I think are just, uh, it's probably you know, either premature to have a conclusion on or to the extent uh, that there is discussion about that conclusion, it might jeopardize the board's interest. Um, the other area of, is the middle school connector roof. This was a new roof, <coughs> uh, a relatively small area, uh, completed in 1989 also. Same contractor and uh, had, uh, and it's very similar to the work that was done on the industrial arts area. Uh, there was no separate design uh, on this uh, area and, uh, and also there was no building permit obtained for this particular uh, work. Um, again, uh, your engineer has been uh, at the site, is doing some current evaluations, has made the definitive evaluation that there's no hazard uh, to safety at the site, but wants to further review what, if any, additional structural uh, changes are required. And again, with this, we would recommend that after you receive that report, if any action is recommended, that that be uh, completed and then apply for an after-the-fact building permit from the town. The last section, which is the uh, so-called D section, um, again, the same contractor was involved, and uh, in, in, in that case, it was a contract. Um, uh, again, the a standard uh, uh, AIA contract, which required the contractor to obtain all permits and comply with all local and state codes and complete the work in uh, a manner appropriate to those codes. Uh, there were no design plans as such, no drawings. Um, as you know, uh, you approved removal of the roof after it had been determined that uh, there was some structural concern about its safety, and that is in the process of uh, being properly stored and, and, uh, and, and determined. Uh, the, I will say that we, do ha we did obtain uh, all the permits for removal of the roof, and a certificate of occupancy has been issued for th that uh, um, space at the, at, by the code enforcement officer. So the use of that space is fully in compliance with, with all town um, requirements. And uh, I, on this area, uh, it's just uncertain what will be the long-term long uh, recommendation, but it would appear that any additional work would probably not be able to be done during the school year just because of the uh, inconvenience and, and, and difficulty of the construction going on during school. There was some confusion with regard to this uh, work um, as to whether or not a permit had been received or had been applied for. There was some understanding on the part of the school department that uh, a permit for another uh, project that was the, some temporary classrooms that were constructed in, in August of this past year included that section of the roof. Uh, but uh, in, fact, uh, in fact, they did not. Um, we will continue to uh, you know, be totally involved with this as far as the progress and, uh, and I think as things get uh, uh, move along over the next few weeks, we'll have a better sense of where the school department's rights uh, lie and we'll be making uh, appropriate reports and recommendations to you at that time. Thank there. you, Mr. Nadzo. I do have you know, a couple of observations that uh, resulting from some questions that have been asked. Uh, as to whether or not building permits do apply to public structures of this kind. In fact, the Cape Elizabeth Ordinance does provide that um, and for those of us who do our own little handiwork at home, we should be aware of this, that no building or structure or part thereof shall be erected, structurally altered, enlarged, repaired, removed, or demolished without a building permit obtained from the building inspector. And this generally does apply to all structures in the town, publicly or privately owned. Um, and finally, I just point out that under the town charter, um, the, uh, the, it is, there is a distinction, there is a, a line between the town and the school department. The town charter does provide that the town manager uh, is a purchasing agent for all town departments except the Department of Education. And, um, and then the town has adopted certain purchasing procedures 
uh, which are in, uh, implemented by the town manager, which basically provides that uh, uh, authority for purchases from less than $250, for example, or uh, handled by department heads, anything over $250 requires town manager's approval. Uh, anything over $2,500 requires competitive bids issued by the town manager, and over anything over $100,000 requires approval by the council. Uh, these are not applicable to the, the, the uh, school department since the whole purchasing um, area is separate. Um, and whereas the school department does have some certain statutory requirements that any appropriations must be approved by the school board. Uh, within the appropriation, then it's up to the school department to adopt any procedures that it determines appropriate for, um, for spending of those appropriations. So. Um, that kind of completes our overview at this point and uh, certainly be uh, responsive to any questions. By now. Questions for Mr. Nanzo? Okay, thank you very much thank for that you. report. And uh, I would appreciate it if you would stand by because I would like to slot in here Mr. Haynes' uh, question, which I would like to ask him to repeat because you were not here when he posed it. Perhaps you wrote it down. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, but it's on videotape. If, uh, <laughs> uh, basically, there's an interest in what the continuing relationship, professional relationship between the present superintendent and the town shall be subsequent to October 1st, 1990. Okay, the answer to that is uh, on uh, October 1st, uh, Dr. Pelletier is on administrative leave. Uh, until the end of his contract on June 30th, 1991. And during that time, uh, he will be available to the board to provide uh, such services as the board requires. So are you prepared to entertain discussion of this matter? Um, it's an interesting procedural question. Uh, I certainly don't want to, uh, you know, stifle uh, uh, debate or public uh, observation. Uh, I just, in view of the hour, I would, would ask that uh, um, we keep the discussion fairly short. I certainly would entertain uh, any, any observation, 10 minutes on the subject. Um, How about a prepared statement? That would be fine. Okay. Um, my name's Patrick Haynes, and I'm speaking for myself and some citizens who are unwilling to speak on these matters. Permit me to introduce myself. I'm a registered professional engineer, a former school administrator, and I formerly taught math and science kindergarten through eighth grade. Most importantly, I'm the father of three children in the Cape schools. My two daughters are in our middle school, a lot has been happening lately, and my reading of the news indicates that some sort of graceful solution is being created to our town's present difficulties. A graceful solution. Had it collapsed, the roof of the middle school would not have come down gracefully. The citizens with whom I've spoken have lost their trust. There's a loss of trust in this board's ability to faithfully discharge its duties loss of the board's trust in the employees that they supervise, loss of trust by our children in an educational system that's somehow gone further and further awry. We're looking at a system that's become so dysfunctional that it threatens their physical safety, a system that's built unsafe roofs over their heads. How are we as responsible citizens, taxpayers, and parents to comprehend the events of this year? What are our responsibilities in these matters as they unfold? What can we do to assure that they never happen again? The citizens need an open, truthful, complete investigation into the events that have led us to our present condition. Neighbors with whom I have spoken have many questions. We need to know the answers to the following. 
which federal, state, or municipal laws, if any, have been broken? What are the penalties for those found guilty of breaking these laws? What is the school board doing to look into these matters? The citizens with whom I've spoken are incredulous and angry that the board is considering a salaried, continuing relationship with the present superintendent. We are asking that the laws of the land and our community be enforced. We need to have you share information with us, information on which you make your decisions. Our children are watching. What will we teach them? I hope that we teach them that they are inheriting a society of laws enacted for the common good, the common safety and well-being of every person. Our children can't vote yet. They are, in effect, the wards of this state. Who will ensure their sustenance and safety if not us? The question that you as a board and we as citizens must ultimately answer is this. Will this remain a society of laws promoting the common good? Uh, thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, Mr. Nazo, would you uh, be in a position to address at this time uh, which federal, state, municipal laws uh, may or may not have been uh, broken? Or is your investigation not gone that far? With regard to the two areas I, I addressed earlier? Or? Well, the, the question is a, is a very general one, and that is uh, we have had, and I think we all know that, a, uh, a potentially calamitous situation. Uh, we averted that uh, situation partly by uh, luck and uh, partly by prompt action. Uh, and uh, again, we uh, are certainly thankful to the engineer who pointed it out twice. Uh, so we have averted the danger, but the question is, in the process, were any federal, state, or municipal laws broken? And if so, which? Who is accountable? What are the penalties? And I'm speaking from memory, but uh, I believe that was the thrust of the question. I think the issue is, is a good one, and uh, obviously the core to this whole issue. And uh, whether it's laws or building codes, I mean, basically state ordinances, and uh, state statutes, rather, and, and town ordinances go to building uh, codes uh, that uh, have to be met. And uh, we have two areas that, that need to be looked at. One is those laws, uh, on the one hand, and the, con and, and the contractual uh, relationship of the schools with the contractors, on the other hand. And I think that the laws we're speaking of are uh, the building code area in the building uh, area. But what we have found is that each, wherever we look, the re responsibility uh, to comply with those uh, legal requirements has been on the contractor or individuals with whom the board has contracted. Uh, that seems, and as far as violation of any um, code standards, any building standards, all of these, these are the issues that uh, I think that uh, well, this, these matters are ultimately going to hinge on, uh, all go back to individuals with whom the board and, and the school department con contracted. Uh, and then we look at those contracts to see, to ensure that they're enforceable. And uh, so that uh, I think there may very well have been violation of uh, local ordinances, uh, state codes that in, in effect incorporate, <coughs> um, are incorporated by the local ordinances. And um, I, I think that's a very good possibility. There's no question about it. Any questions or observations from the board? Well, your investigation will, uh, and your final report, will touch on all of these issues. And you've noted, uh, perhaps you should, uh, you might get a, a copy of uh, Mr. Haynes' statement. Um, I'd certainly like one. I will. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you and good evening. My name is William O'Neill and I'm a resident of the town. The council in delineating his impression about the competitive bidding law 
to me, I think I heard an emphasis that the town side was bound by competitive bidding processes. The question I would ask is the school side bound in the same way? And if not, were these contracts put out for competitive bid? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your question. I, I apologize if I didn't make it clear. The, the competitive bidding is a town process. It's a procedure adopted by the town. Uh, that procedure does not uh, apply to the school department. The school department is, uh, and the school board is, uh, within its own rights to adopt uh, procedures similar to that or not adopt procedures similar to that. In my knowledge, no such procedures have been adopted. Uh, therefore, it's pretty much on a case-by-case -case basis and uh, within discretion of the board and, and the, uh, uh, the administrators. I think that uh, the initial mm -hmm. uh, one, if I'm not mistaken, I believe may The first one, yes, first and the other two, no. The other two, no. Any other public comment? Any other board questions? Okay, thank you, Mr. Nadzu. The uh, next item on the, uh, the agenda, continuing with the adjusted uh, agenda, will be the auditor's report, if indeed the auditors are here, our independent auditors are Runyon, Kirstein, Wallet, and Lessard, and they're so independent that I don't know Mr. Uh, Kirstein. I've spoken to him on the telephone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with me this evening is Greg Lura, who is one of my associates who uh, was a senior on, on the engagement uh, for the audit of, of Cape Elizabeth. Forgive me, we just come from a similar discussion at Old Orchard Beach. I hope it's not similar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, both communities have concerns different in nature. We have uh, been in the process of uh, performing the audit of June 30th, 1990. Uh, for the last uh, month or so, that audit uh, is almost complete. Um, however, it is, it is not complete and no audit report has been issued. Understanding that it's not until October that the school board meets again, Chairman Leslie uh, contacted us late yesterday and asked if we could uh, make a, a short presentation this evening and provide you with a status report. Uh, what I'd like to do at this time is to, to hand out uh, a draft of the financial results of fiscal 1990 um, as it relates to the school department. Um, and I would simply ask if you could pass those along. Please understand that uh, while the bulk of the field work has been completed, these numbers have not been reviewed. and either by our management or uh, with the uh, management of the school department. So they are, it says draft on them, they really are preliminary draft. And really all I'd like to do is to summarize the bottom line, which is on page two, which shows a fund balance of approximately $240,000 uh, for the last fiscal year. Excluded from that amount, however, is an encumbrance of approximately $46,000 for the purchase of a school bus. The significance of that number is that in your current budget, uh, you have estimated a carry forward balance of approximately $350,000. Excluded from that carry forward, however, and excluded from the current year revenues is a $46,000 revenue item to finance that $46,000 encumbrance that I just referred to. In short, it appears that you could be entering the current fiscal year $110,000 to $120,000 uh, short of where you anticipated you'd be. So the financial picture uh, is not as rosy um, as you once thought, uh, and uh, hopefully that uh, adjustments made in the current year can make up for that, sh that sh shortfall. 
Excuse me, did I understand that includes the, the bus or doesn't include the bus? I'm Forget the bus. Forget the, the bus. bus is a wash. The bus, there's, the bus there's an offset to the okay. 239. There's an equal off, offset in the current year revenues. Account the, bus, the bus is not shown as an expenditure for this statement. Okay. Thank you. An encumbrance means, I assume, an account's payable. Then we you have. May, you may think of it as, as that, yes. We then have an account's receivable in effect exactly. next year from the state. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, it's a wash. Okay. Thank you. Prior to the time that we commenced our actual field work, uh, Chairman Leslie contacted us and, and made certain requests uh, that we pursue certain matters, that uh, we be uh, perhaps more di diligent in internal control matters um, than we might otherwise be, that we target certain areas. And we have done that. Several weeks ago, uh, Mr. Allura met with uh, Chairman Leslie and with uh, the Chairman of the Town Council and provided them with a summary of uh, our audit findings at that point. Um, and I would like to take this opportunity to provide you all with an executive summary of that discussion and uh, perhaps comment on some other matters. One of the items covered in that discussion was the purchase order system um, and the control of expenditures. And there really are two points um, with regard to that system. Um, the, f the first relates to the systematic review of invoices, which we believe uh, is a process that could be strengthened. Uh, the business manager of the school department admittedly doesn't review all those invoices to the extent that perhaps he should. In addition, although we have no reason to believe that the, the accuracy and validity of those invoices is not verified, the indication of that review um, and verification is, is not made on each invoice. Um, we would recommend that the business manager perform a more detailed review of all of the expenditures that are being made. The second item relating to the purchasing system is that there is an opportunity in the school department for management override. Um, and that's going to occur. Um, and so the, the best that the school department can do is to seek ways of minimizing that type of management override. Could you explain management override? All right. Now I know what it means. <laughs> <laughs> Man management override is, is a process in which, although there may be established procedures, um, that the senior members of management, because of their power, because of their authority, may indeed be able to dictate that those policies be violated or um, abrogated. Uh, it's, it is, is in almost all cases, feasible, regardless of the strength of a system. And what an auditor looks for are ways to minimize the opportunity for that. Any system relies on its personnel from the top down. Um, the most obvious area of management override is with a computer system where one individual has a master password and theoretically can, can enter that computer system and manipulate data. Uh, that's not a concern in the town of Cape Elizabeth. I uh, use that only as an example. Let me interject here that um, in early conversations with the chairman, we indicated that in general, the town of Cape Elizabeth, including the school department, has an excellent system of internal accounting controls. Um, that continues to be the case. That discussion also uh, included uh, the area of personnel policies. Um, on the town side, there is a clearly stated uh, set of guidelines that contemplate a personnel policy. 
although many items that would be included in a, in a formal personnel policy for the school are included in teacher contracts. Uh, we noted that similar policies are not established in writing for non-teacher employees of the school department. That can pose some, some problems and can, can pose, uh, can create situations in which there are different practices from one group of individuals to another or from individual to individual. You just discussed the bid policy. Um, I might add that it is not uncommon amongst our clients that the municipal side does have uh, precise policies for bidding practices and for school departments not to. That's not to say that that is correct. Um, finally, uh, the chairman requested that, that we, we review the correspondence file um, that was provided to us that represented concerns, comments, inquiries from various citizens and taxpayers. And we performed that review. And this may be an oversimplification, but I think we can classify those inquiries into two broad categories. The first really represented inquiries into budget methodology, uh, practices used in the, in the development of the school uh, budgets. We, in our professional capacity, uh, shy away from getting involved in the methods used in developing budgets, uh, except to the extent that they may be grossly misstated and have a, a negative impact on your financial condition. So we did not address directly those inquiries relating to budget methodologies. But I will interject one, one minor comment. And one of the, one of the, the inquiries related to the amount that uh, was appropriated for <coughs> teacher salaries for positions that needed to be uh, replaced. And that amount was uniformly established at approximately $32,000. Um, we're not in a position to, to judge that amount, but we would urge the school board to, to review that on an annual basis to ascertain uh, the propriety of that number. It was the correct number the last year, as I recall. That is our understanding as and well. And we just carried it forward and then uh, hired uh, teachers at a lower level on the uh, we the only index. point out that you should it was not ignore that, that amount that you should challenge that amount annually mm -hmm. particularly since this year the actual amount came in less than that on the other hand we would also caution that you use a conservative amount uh, because we're sounds like can't win <laughs> you're right <laughs> the other broad category of inquiry uh, re related to accounting matters and they were legitimate inquiries regarding transactions that had been made on the school department's financial records. Most of them were unique kind of entries, um, which quite frankly were not obvious on the surface. Um, they were all, however, uh, legitimate transactions um, with no malfeasance or uh, improprieties. They were all legitimate accounting entries. <clears throat> Sub part, uh, let me see, how do I explain this? One of the inquiries related to, uh, almost tangentially, in, to uh, fringe benefits received in cash in lieu of benefits. That struck home. It related to a, a specific individual, and um, as is, as you know now, we uh, further pursued that and found out that uh, there were um, 
additional instances in which cash was paid in lieu of fringe benefits. Do you wish, wish for me to expound on that at this time, Chairman? Oh, yes. I, uh, I asked you to ensure that our internal controls were very tight, and uh, I asked you to ensure that we were complying with uh, all federal, state, municipal regulations. Uh, and uh, I think you did that, and you found out that uh, we were not complying. And uh, I think it's also of interest to describe uh, perhaps how that slipped by in earlier years through your, you know, standard random uh, test uh, accounting procedures, uh, auditing procedures. Okay, why don't I address that right off the bat? And I, there are two comments with, with regard to that. Um, if you read the auditor's opinion, um, our audit is not intended to be a fraud audit, neither is it intended to identify all errors or omissions. Um, as I'm sh sure you're aware, uh, our procedures consist of a series of sam sample tests uh, to ensure that the internal control systems that have been designed by the town are in fact functioning as designed and are functioning to ensure proper internal controls in such a manner that there will not be a material misstatement of the financial statements. I think the lawyers told us how to uh, couch our opinion. This, secondly, uh, there have been no amounts dispersed illegally uh, or inappropriately. Uh, they were made by contract. Uh, they were made by in, with all good intention. We do not routinely identify the taxability of payments made to employees. Now that simply is, is normally, anyhow, not in the overall purview of our financial audit. Obviously, if we become aware of matters like these, we bring them to your attention, and that's what we, we did in this particular case. Specifically, uh, the internal revenue uh, presently uh, specifies that fringe benefit programs in general terms, cannot be discriminatory between classes of employees. There were situations with the school department in which non-teacher employees were, on an individual basis, offered opportunities to receive health insurance benefits um, in the form of insurance premiums paid for by the school department or alternatively to receive cash. And the cash amounts differed by individual. To the extent that those amounts differed, you had a discriminatory fringe benefit program. But more importantly, what you really had and didn't know it was what is now referred to as a cafeteria plan in which an, an employee, as a group, has an option of receiving a benefit or cash. Those plans are very common today. To the extent that an employee receives cash, that amount is to be treated as taxable income. And the cash that was being paid in lieu of fringe benefits by the, the school department was not being included on the employee's W-2 forms. Um, we brought that to the attention of the school department. Um, I might add that this is a, a not, not a situation unique to Cape Elizabeth. Um, we have identified it elsewhere. And, and I must say it was a matter of hours, not days or weeks, before the administration uh, sought to rectify uh, this honest and unknown dilemma. Um, a member of our firm um, who specializes in the fringe benefit area 
uh, met with uh, the superintendent and uh, together, I believe, with Nick Nadzo, um, are in the process of developing a legitimate cafeteria plan. The other area that, that concerns us that was similar, it didn't relate to health, uh, to health insurance premiums, uh, was that there were two individuals um, who by contract uh, did not participate in the uh, Maine State Retirement Program. And in lieu of that, uh, the school department uh, provided them with cash payments um, in lieu of that benefit. Which were much smaller, I believe, than the contributions that we would have otherwise made to the MSRS. That is correct. The, the, the school economically benefited. Uh, one of those individuals, the other one was just the employer share. That's correct. Um, and uh, likewise, at least in some situations, those cash payments were not reported on the W 2 forms to the employee. I'd like to, while you're pausing, uh, retract what I said uh, earlier about slipping by a random auditing system. I know perfectly well that random auditing systems are small samples and that inevitably a certain number of things will go through that net and that's perfectly normal in, uh, in the auditing uh, profession. So if, if anybody misinterpreted my comment slip mm -hmm. by, I want to recharacterize it as a perfectly normal. Uh, occurrence in my experience. Uh, the other thing that, that, that uh, should be pointed out, and, and I think the superintendent has do done so, uh, is that this is not a recent phenomenon uh, here or elsewhere. It's been uh, something that, that school departments have been doing for, for decades, literally. Um, the tax code, however, changed in 1986. That was going to be my question. Has it been slipping by because it wasn't a law and now the law has changed or is it just been uh, the people did not know the law even that many years ago? Um, tax code has been changing. Uh, if, if you re on the opposite side, the, the town, um, most towns uh, er, for years provided employees, certainly town managers, with automobile stipends, which went untaxed. Um, not time flies, but four or five years ago, uh, that came to a screeching halt as well, um, with s certain exceptions. Um, so in the area, f the fr whole fringe benefit area is is one that it has been evolving over the last decade and certainly will continue to evolve. Um, one other little item that was discussed in that meeting a few weeks ago um, was a petty cash account that exists um, for legitimate petty cash items. Uh, like postage and, and the like, uh, which we believe would be better controlled by someone other than the accounts payable clerk uh, who is responsible for replenishing it and dispersing it. The activity in that account was fine, but it just it, in, in, in looking at the segregation of duties that you should remove that uh, authority from that person and, and place it with somebody else that's uninvolved with the payable to the face of that. Sure. That process. should be no problem and it yeah. sounds like good practice and we'll do it. There are probably going to be other comments, um, nothing of, of a great deal of substance that will be um, put together in our formal uh, letter of reportable conditions or management letter or whatever you want to call it, uh, which still is in the development stage. Um, these, as well as some other comments that relate to also, um, some of the comments that relate to the town also involve the school, uh, but they're just general comments and they do not really necessarily um, need to be addressed tonight. Any board comment, Mr. Greer? 
Mr. Chairman. I have a couple questions on, on management override. What would be suggestions from the board's perspective to, to control this? One thing that's been discussed is whether or not the school board needs to uh, formally review the warrants and sign off on those warrants. Um, that administratively uh, is done. Um, thorough review of that process is probably uh, not being done. So that might be uh, one instance where formal review of the warrant, more formal review of the warrant is maintained. Uh, that I would suggest is done by a selected individual of the, of the board. When you're trying to get three individuals to come in and sign off on the warrants before the checks are released, that becomes very difficult uh, and burdensome on the, on the school board. I'm going to go out on, on a limb here because I, I have a, a personal uh, a, approach that I like to take and suggest. I know of very few communities that have actually done this. And that is to have the finance director, business manager, controller, whatever title it is that you use. Um, have two lines of communication, two lines of authority. Um, one, administratively, to the superintendent, superintendent or town manager, and the other, in his fiduciary capacity, directly to the governing body, whether that be the school board or the town council. I say that because we have seen in other communities where the big boss, whether it be a superintendent or a town manager, wields such authority over someone's job that the treasurer or business manager intentionally violates policy or does that which should not be done for fear of that individual's job. And the treasurer or business manager reports directly to that manager or superintendent. If I was in that position, I would want a direct access to the governing body. Um, that's not commonly done. Uh, but if I was on a governing body, I would want that. It is commonly done in the private sector where a comptroller or a, can go directly to the board. That is correct. Why is it not commonly done in municipal government? Perhaps because charters were written in, in the last century and every time a charter review came up, uh, it was somehow passed by. I don't know the answer to that. I know that it is being seriously considered in one of our other clients on the municipal side. <laughs> Another question um, concerning the setting up of a cafeteria, a formalized cafeteria plan, how does that affect the bargained units that we deal with in those contracts? It does not. It does not. They're bound by that contract. They have no option. The discrimination provisions uh, relate to groups of employees, and the contracting unit is defined as a group, um, which is distinct from another group. And you can create as many distinct groups as you would like as long as there are legitimate reasons for making such a grouping. For instance, there are distinct differences between the administrative employees and the janitorial employees, for instance. Uh, if you were to create a central office administration as a group, excluding uh, separate school administrators, uh, you're getting into a gray area that I would defer to the fringe benefit and legal experts on. Right. Thank you. Jen? John? I, I'm interested in your comment about uh, challenging the new teacher projected salary next year. Now, the thinking this year, when, when I think we had 17 new teachers to hire and we took 
what was the average teacher salary in Cape Elizabeth, which was $32,000, and, and use that as our educated guess of what our needs would be when, when we were hiring new teachers. Um, what's your suggestion? I knew I shouldn't have brought that one well, up. I had to use an so example logical. and I picked a bad one. Uh, I'm not sure that I would do anything differently. Um, but uh, next year, uh, now that you have this year's experience, um, look at that number closely. That was our only recommendation. It may well be that the estimate stays at 32,000, if that's your, your educated guess. Um, we have no reason to challenge that number. It's just that there was such a significant swing that um, well, but isn't this just certainly a, something that should be at the forefront of your mind in the budgetary I mean, review process? I mean, we obviously have uh, an oil estimate, which is probably not realistic uh, mm -hmm. in terms of recent, in the light of recent events. Isn't that just a normal part of budgeting? Yes. If sir, the previous yes. year you hire yeah. eight teachers and the average is thirty-two thousand, and the next year you average uh, you you hire twelve and the the average is. 27. Sure. One of the things that we were going to talk about tonight was, was budget, budgetary transfers. We're um, going to talk, that's on the agenda in a sort of backhanded way. We're going to talk about it too. Uh, but you go ahead and, and give us your observations on that, please. The school department historically has not had a significant number of budgetary transfers. Um, there are some school departments that uh, use that tool uh, to such an extent that when the final financial statements come out, there are absolutely no variations between the actual expenditures and the budget. Uh, I don't think that benefits anyone. Absolutely um, not. On the other hand, um, and oil is, is, is an excellent example, we would encourage you to um, encourage your administrative uh, personnel to come before you for those budgetary transfers of significant amounts, such as significant increases in fuel oil or the reductions due to teacher salaries. Yeah. What we intend to do or what I intend to propose to the board tonight is that uh, any transfers pass through the board. Uh, the, the best example being uh, the reduction in the new teacher's account and the increase in uh, or the reinstatement of a number of accounts including the uh, the home economics program and that every such transfer in the budget would come through a board meeting and then the comment would be invited and if a teacher were reinstated that would be the occasion in which uh, his or her position would be reinstated and uh, so that was uh, you beat me to the punch on that one but I also think it's a good idea Any further questions from the board? I have one clarification on his preliminary audit. If you're, you state that we would be $110,000 short on this current year, is that looking at what we have projected, budgeted for next year? Yes. So even though we go in at 352000 in the the black, we may be...